I'm just going to do a quick video here about, I'm just going to see where it takes me. Um, I just thought oh, I could do a video about passion, about music. I haven't thought about it, I'm just doing this. It could go anywhere or nowhere. My passion for music has changed over the last few years. It's definitely, sometimes it wanes. Sometimes uh, it's, it's not necessarily the music which excites me so much as the collecting of records. Uh, or some of it's been, there have been periods when it's been the interest around certain periods of music or certain things to do with artists, etc. But fundamentally, I think the music is always still the number one because it's it's still what I'm looking for, it's still what I'm listening out for. I like to pick up stuff um, and just try them out. I will not go and pay 25, 30 quid for a record to try it out. Pointless. You know, it's just a waste of money. But I will, you know, you know I buy a lot of stuff in charity shops, I'll pick it up. I know a lot of stuff, I just by telling, I can just tell now. I don't want this, I don't want that, <laughs> you know. You can just tell. Um, but there's a, you know, the, the last few years there have definitely been a, a change in the way I look at things and the way I collect things. I picked this up. I would never pick this up. Maybe even a, two or three years ago when I picked this up. This is Jerry Gray on the bandstand. He used to be in the Glenn Miller band until he created his own after Glenn Miller uh, vanished from the face of the earth. But it's got a great feel. This is Russian Patrol, part one and part two. It's 1940s. Just wonderful stuff. Sometimes I you know, I think, well, I'll try it. I was actually given these records <laughs> in the charity shop today. They said, I'll just take them. I'm finding my ears kind of opening up to us as well as stuff. Um, yeah, we hear a lot of uh, bad jazz in the VC, you know, it's like a constant thing. It's just like over and over and over, you know. It's, Especially amongst audio files and whatnot, if you got the latest blue note and all this rubbish. There's a real sort of sense of time and place. It's completely different to what we'd normally listen to nowadays. This sort of earlier jazz is just completely overlooked in the main. I mean, I've picked up, as some of you know, I've picked up a a fair amount of UK jazz in the last uh, two or three years, yeah, 50s and early 60s, and that's really interesting because it the whole, opens up a whole new world of, of interest, what was happening in the culture and society of the time, uh, how these people uh, brought that music to the fore. I mean, it's a very small niche kind of thing, and it got bigger and bigger through Ronnie Scott's club, etc., and they were bringing over Americans and whatnot. You know, it's just interesting to me. Far more interesting than the 60s US jazz. I mean, that's just like whatever. All the information's there. Everyone knows about it. You know, it's like, it's over and over, you hear the same stuff. It's always Coltrane, and if you keep hearing these names, you know. Um, but that earlier period just gets overlooked. And when you go even further back to this sort of period, and even further back to the 20s and 30s, you might just forget it. I mean, who, who even shows that stuff? I mean, I personally really like that kind of period. I don't know a huge amount about it, but what fascinates me is the period. I think nowadays we're so far removed from the period, from the music, from the culture, from the way the world was, but it's difficult to kind of connect with it. It's almost like it's too far away. It's like if we see pictures of Victorians or whatever, they seem so far removed from us. It might be 110 years ago. 
And when you listen to music from the 1920s, it can seem so distant. Culture is so different. Now, all right, we could listen to blues like Robert Johnson and whatnot. But again, we're so, we've heard so much electric blues, but that seems so hard to, to get into in a way. It's quite difficult. And anyway, we're recording as we tend to hear, tend to be later recordings. Because people don't really collect the 78s on the next phase of a rare. But it's just a sense of place and time, which, you know, is maybe so alien to us. I'll play something from even further back. This is... Uh, Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang's Blue Five. Now Eddie Lang, the poor guy, he was a guitarist and then up until he appeared in bands, guitar was never a featured instrument. Um, unfortunately he died at the age of 29 or 30. Uh, he, had, he used to suffer really bad sore throats and whatnot and they went to have his tonsils out um, and died in the operation. Kind of really bizarre. Anyway, let's uh, listen to one of these. It's so far removed, and yet it's, it's just a fascinating sound and period, really. And my passion has changed. I spent a long time in pro you know, progressive and kraut and psychedelic rock and all that. And jazz, it doesn't always click with me. Especially the 60s jazz. Yeah, I can listen to it. Yeah, it's good. But there's something about the social aspect, the historical aspect, etc., etc., which fascinates me alongside it. Sometimes I need more than just the music. I don't know what it is. It's like this. You have to almost, because it's so far removed from our, from the way we listen to music now, the sound of music now, we can't really tr sort of pinpoint anything we listen to now, which sounds like this. And I think sometimes we have to add something. If you imagine these guys are playing in a club in the early 30s, 1933 this is. You know, you can imagine the speakeasy or whatever it might be, the club like you see in uh, any of those Busby Berkeley films or whatever. And then suddenly it brings it to life. You've got the picture, you've got a sense of the period, you've got the hats, the suits, you know. Uh, Tommy guns, whatever, whatever it comes into it, but it's just it brings us closer to. And to me, there's an element of the passion of collecting and music and whatnot, which actually is that, which is the placing of it. It just because I don't think necessarily this is easy for us to connect to just on a musical level anymore. I think a good tune though will always stand out, will always go wrong. But it takes a certain kind of person to kind of connect with it, I think. I think it takes a little bit of effort. So like classical music, well, a lot of us just do not listen to it. It's just not part of our cultural, kind of, the, the way we live our lives. It's not, we don't hear it every day. It's just not part of our world anymore. All we ever hear is cruddy R&B crud, you know. That's all we get kind of here. You hear you go to the shops and you see TV and all that. Dross, and that becomes like the, the our modern culture. That that kind of music will be completely forgotten about. You know, in a hundred years time, we'll be like, what were they listening to? And as we do our revisionist stuff of the fifties and sixties, and we'd say, oh yeah, everyone was listening to uh, the hippie stuff in the sixties. They weren't at all. They were listening to Engelbert Humperdinck. You know, they were listening to the really the, the straight laced middle of a road stuff. It was the subculture, which was. Uh, which we have elevated and made bigger than everything else. You know, it's a strange thing, really. But we'll do the same. If people will do the same about this period. People in the future will look at pictures of us holding our mobile phones and go, <laughs> look at how ridiculous do they look. You know, we're going to look like the Victorians do do to us. And we kind of imagine, we can't imagine what music will be or what the world will be. We can pretend to, or we can envisage it as best we can, but we have no idea. 
you knew a hundred years ago that the internet and this and this mobile phone <laughs> would just be part of the world. You couldn't foresee it. And who knows what a hundred years time will be. But they will revise as we revise. And they will try to connect as we try to connect. And we only do it with our own you know, what we choose and our own limited understandings. And what we almost want to be telling ourselves, what re resonates in our culture of the time is what we tell ourselves now. These are the things that our culture aspires to. These are the, the, uh, the wonderful things. These are the things that are meaningful and, you know, uh, life-changing and whatever. They're not at all. They're just and things that have been sort of plucked out and then this is, you get told these messages. Now, here we are nowadays, we just, we walk around the shops, buying whatever we like, doing whatever we like. You know, there are still people in this world who can't do any of that. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, people never couldn't do any of that. They didn't have that kind of culture that we have now. Unless you, had, you were well off in the cities, and you had to be very well off. You had a very hard life, you know, <laughs> so... I just think sometimes, you know, people used to live their entire lives just in a little house, a little hut or something, working the land for like 50 years or something, and never even went to the next village, you know, but now we, we demand holidays, we demand these things, these are all things that are essential to life. You know, we're buying all of these records because it's, we can't do without them, but, you know, how could we live without it? I've been questioning lately whether I should just, if, I, if it's possible for me to get rid of all my stuff. That's extreme because I'm just, it's hypothetical. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I didn't have anywhere near the amount of stuff I have now. Of course I didn't. You know, but over the years I have accumulated a lot of stuff thousands of, you know, just ridiculous amounts of records and books and all sorts. And you just think, well, life would be so much easier without it sometimes. Because really, what do you actually need, you know? But there's still that bit of me, which is, you know, I get fascinated by this stuff and I want to know more and I want to explore more and if I see it, I'll pick it up. And then you add it to your collection, you know? It's a, it's just something we all do. Anyway, I'm kind of running on here. I don't think this video will probably be uploaded. It's just a sort of literally splurge, you know. Let's have a listen to this. This is not Jack Buchanan singing. But I really love his voice. This is Elsie Randolph. That's always tomorrow. Again, it's so different, isn't it? We don't listen to anything like this anymore. It's a funny way to open an EP, isn't it? You know, <laughs> memories of Jack Buchanan. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> yeah, anyway, just lovely, lovely stuff. Melodies. Where do we hear that? And if you listen to enough of these, you listen to a few in a row, it kind of changes from your sensibilities in a way, the way you hear the world. It changes the way you, you think almost. It does something to you. It's like that with all music. If you immerse yourself in a particular kind of music, whether it's heavy metal, you know, whatever it may be, 
whether it's a uh, you know hardcore punk if you listen to it for a long period it, it sort of changes and your you the way you think and the way you react and the way you feel it does something to you and this this has a sort of a wistful nostalgic it's not a nostalgia for any period I've lived but in a way there was a long period in my life where I spent uh, exploring in the early 30s films and whatnot and the music of that period and the lyrics especially just wonderful and it does do something to you it just changes the way you feel pleasant quality to it, and a, a charm which you just don't hear in music anymore. I, I mean some of these were obviously for stage uh, shows and stuff, so it's again it's a different kind of audience, a different way of recording and producing music. Probably just leave it there. I'm just going on for far too long. If anyone has made it this far, I don't know. I've kind of, uh, I'm so tired that I can't even think beyond that. <laughs> I decided to go to And gives him mental indigestion. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, talking about mental indigestion, <laughs> there's a lot of that here, wasn't it? Well, that'll be it. I'll see you all later.